After Michael Slager was indicted on federal charges related to the Walter Scott case, I sit down exclusively with Reverend Joe Darby and Dot Scott of the Charleston NAACP for a special edition of Quentin's Close Ups. Let me start this particular interview with the obvious, Michael Slager. The former North Charleston police officer accused of shooting Walter Scott several times in the back in a park in North Charleston last April has been indicted on federal charges. According to Channel 2, Slager was charged with violating Walter Scott's civil rights. In addition to the civil rights charge, Slager has been charged with obstruction of justice and unlawful use of a weapon during the commission of a crime. If found guilty, he could get life in prison on the civil rights charge and pay $250,000 in fines. Scott family attorney Chris Stewart told the media immediately after the charges came down that, quote, this is history. It could be a turning point in history that the federal government is no longer going to sit on the sidelines. They're going to make police officers face federal justice. And I'm wondering, what was it like to see federal justice on Wednesday? For me, it was great. It's, it's something we never see. Usually federal um, uh, doesn't get involved. And I think that um, that sends a message, a very strong message, that um, it's not going to be tolerated and you're not going to be able to have your, what I call, <coughs> the buddies and the folks that you work with. So that's around you to protect you once you've done something as egregious as what happened to Walter Scott. And go ahead. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm very pleased the federal government got involved, uh, especially because it adds an extra level of hopeful fairness. Scarlett Wilson, our solicitor, to my knowledge, has never tried a white man for killing a black man and has never tried a police officer. So we have no way of knowing how she would do, how competent she would be. The federal government ensures that if her competence is not up to speed, that somebody else who can do something. Judy Scott, which is Walter Scott's mother. She told the media, quote, this is a sad day for me, but I thank God that the prayers of the righteous and feel of much and that God had seen, he knew from the beginning what went on. They tried to cover it up again, but it's time that cover was pilled. When the cover was pilled, what was going to your mind? Well, the history for, as Reverend Darby alluded to, when you've never seen justice, when, when you have a killing that one of our police officers are involved in, and it's always justified, even before the information uh, is actually, any true information takes place, and the narrative right away began to show that there was a cover-up as soon as the videotape uh, came came forth. You knew then that there was an attempt beginning to cover up. So um, some of the stories about the moving of the taser and other things that were very obvious knew that here was business as usual. And unless we can get the federal government to continue, not only to get involved in the police shooting, but for other issues that happen in local communities when civil rights violation takes place, that um, more often than not, justice will not prevail. And Reverend Oh yeah, and it, it, it needs to be understood. The Walter Scott killing did not happen in a vacuum. Um, there's a long list of black men uh, that have been killed under suspicious circumstances, under suspicious circumstances, by North Charleston, by Charleston, and by the Sheriff's Department. Only difference this time is you got video. Mm -hmm. If not for that video, Officer Slater would probably be walking the streets right now talking about it community service. And the other thing, and I think you back on that, uh, liking the issue of Walter Scott and the fact that things were being moved around, the very same thing happened here in Charleston with the Denzel O'Carnell issue. So these are the kinds of stuff that uh, we have to ha continue to believe the hope of getting the federal government and the federal investigation involved, uh, we should not let it rest. We should not let it rest because if <clears throat> our solicitor has proven time and time again, she, it's never going to be an issue where she'll find that the officer was wrong. So we, we're really pleased about that uh, information. Denzel Cornell, from what I understand, what, it's going to be two years now since it's passing? Yes, yeah. yes. Where are you guys emotional with that? I am distraught actually because there every every information every piece of information we've known and both Reverend Darby and myself and uh, uh, turning um, 
Andy Savage right. and so on. You know, there have been extensive um, investigation around the local stuff of expert witnesses. Everything points to it's highly unlikely, highly unlikely that this young man killed himself. And the, the way that the case was handled, the way the investigation went on, the lack of transparency, it was uh, another rubber stamp, just like the Daryl Drayton stuff. The officer kills him, this is what it is, that's done. The only uh, thing I think is a little bit different with Denzel's uh, killing is that because when our uh, solicitor and whomever decides that we're gonna label this a suicide, Oftentimes, it's not talked about in the same conversation as other police shooting or killing. Finish these sentences for me. The closing of Lincoln Middle High School is a shame, a racist shame. It's a, exactly. I think we we continue to be too polite and not mention the fact that it's all about race. At least I said it. You know, in the in the early in the fifties, right. uh, they at least were prepared to provide us with equalization schools. In other words, we don't want you to go to school with us, but at least we'll build a school in your neighborhood and we'll have a school. It's, been, it's gotten so blatant that that is not even an option. We will put your kids on the bus for 10 hours a week or 40 hours a month and we'll herd them to an overcrowded school. We'll put them in a situation that they'll probably be uh, so frustrating and frustrated and out of, of, of a comfort zone to even learn because you're going to place them in places where these uh, young people are not kind. Uh, they'll, they'll be in a position where folks are, they're the other children, and the teacher's gonna, we're gonna have to slow it down just so we and, can get these people caught up. And I find it particularly insulting that Kate Darby, who is definitely no relation, um, made comments that it appears that she was saying, we know what's best for black people. Mm -hmm. um, that's the kind of paternalistic, ignorant stuff that has held our schools back. You're talking about a district that spent millions to re renovate the Rivers Building for the Charter School right. for Math and Science. They spent millions to build a new state-of-the-art elementary school on Sullivan's Island. It's got a handful of kids in it. And yet they say that they're going to close Lincoln because it's not cost-effective. When they could have bused Wando students from the northern end of the Wando zone to Lincoln, gotten up the population, broadened the course offerings. That's called racism. Mm -hmm. And it's time to stop. And I hope we stop it in November at the polls. Those folk who voted to close Lincoln need to go. And I think we are, we're at a point, at least I'm feeling that we need to do something. We usually look at them, the board in an aggregate, <clears throat> like this is one, this is just one body. But when, when you have folks that represent a particular area, and uh, I'm told that these board members who are deciding what's best for our children, because surely the, the slave mentality is, I know what's best for my slaves, it's the same as we know what's best for these children. Somehow, what's best for our children, what's best for theirs, it's never the same thing. And I think we need to be talking about them, calling them racist, and 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 keep it in in front of them that they continue to breathe what I call as we come up on the anniversary of the Mother Emanuel uh, of year anniversary that. You, the, the behavior of these people are breeding the mindset of the Dylan Roos. These children will do fine if we allow them to integrate and learn together. Uh, but it's the parents, it's that, that basic instinct of superiority that we refuse to have this situation or be enabling for that to happen. So I think we need to get up front and really identify these people personally as to who they are, what they do, and so people won't talk about them as the board. We need to talk about Kate Darwin, we need to talk about Stubbs as the, in, in their capacity as a representative for a group such as that. And then we need to talk about our black board members that are there because oftentimes when the vote comes up, it's already given, even if you vote on the side of, of what's best for the African-American children, 
if you already know that's not going, you're going to be on the losing end. It's comfortable for you to do that, almost to the point that the counterparts, and I said, okay, you can do it, but we've got the number of votes. You have to wonder, though, why not the outrage from those members that look like the children that are being disenfranchised in terms of education. So we have to ask questions of them as well. We tend to be very kind to folks when they're the same color that we are, but does that necessarily make it true? Uh, the Sanders Clive Creative Arts School should be, as far as middle school students, should be maintained and strengthened. Um, and I think that that's possible if the district actually does effective zoning. You right now have a district that talks, for example, <coughs> about uh, the difficulty in getting students to Burke. Sure. Um, they're busing students further from other schools to other schools than to Berk. Uh, the distance to one, from Wando to Berk is shorter than some other busing distances that they're doing now. Mm -hmm. Why will the district not put other children at Berk High School? I think that's a question that Ms. Coase needs to be asked when she wakes up, since she said she sleeps very soundly um, after she has done an outrageous act. I think that that's the kind of thing the board should be held accountable for. And you talk about Mother Emanuel. I just interviewed uh, Betty Dees Clark on mm -hmm. Tuesday afternoon. And I'm wondering, when you think back to that tragedy to now, a year later, what still plays in your mind? A place in my mind that here we're celebrating. And I spoke to, these are some folks that are not African American. Okay. And as we talk, because I think that um, Mother Emanuel, in my opinion, and also from conversation I've had with members of that church, right. it's almost like the image of Mother Emanuel has been hijacked and it's not benefiting us. When I say us, the people who these folks are akin to, their neighborhood, their school, right. everything economically, we're talking about gobs of money that came in here, and I said in a couple of years, all of that money will probably vanish, and what do we net for it? Why is it that we can have a bridge full of people singing, we shall overcome, and yet we have nobody voicing the concerns about what's happening to these children? I think uh, Senator Pinkley cared about these kids as well. Now we've got a problem with the school that's got to bear his name and the name of uh, uh, Mr. Simmons. Thank now you. there's some controversy whether or not they're going to let the assistant principal who happens to be African American now be the principal there because the, 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 the push is to get somebody else because that school happens to be in a neighborhood that serves the Wagner Terrace and the downtown area of kids. So we have to really look at are we what are we celebrating um, come June 17th again? What are we really celebrating? How much difference has that made for us? And, and, and while there are surely a lot of people who are doing good things and have genuine and Ten in terms of making our cities better, our city better. Uh, we have far too many still living in the past and using this as a panacea that thinks all well. I said a year ago, not long after the horrible, horrible thing happened, that one of two things would happen: either this would be something that would bring a sea change in race in our community and beyond our community, or it would be a big kumbaya moment that was built mainly to assuage white guilt. I lean towards the latter because it looks like a big kumbaya moment that assuaged white guilt. It's done a lot of feel-good stuff. Folk have descended from all across the nation to worship with Emmanuel. Right. Might ought to let them read a little bit and mm -hmm. finish that. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's been no change. You know, our governor who was heartbroken is still pushing gun rights. Uh, our city, which did all of the hand-holding across the bridge, named for a racist okay. bridge, um, has not changed a bit. The school system is, as far as relations across racial lines, that markedly worse instead of better. Uh, it's been a convenient thing for people to wave as, as an excuse now, just as people try to wave Martin King's statement about color of skin and content of character, to say that we're united. No, we're not united, and you cannot use justification that you did not celebrate a racist murder that say we united. You're not supposed to celebrate a racist murder. So you don't get any points for that. You get points when you do things to change the climate that led to that racist murder. Well, as always, it's good talking to Dr. Scott and Reverend Joe Darby. Thank you so much for this time. You're Thanks, welcome. Man. I appreciate it.